So I finally get to meet the courier who's accomplished so much in so little time. Hey Caesar, this is really cool and all, but I need to deal with Benny. Benny is my prisoner. You don't deal with him unless you've dealt with me. Dude, you're actually Garrett right now. Don't worry. You'll get the platinum chip he was carrying. And then you'll use it like I tell you to. Yeah, go f*** yourself. After the success of Fallout 3, Bethesda gave its decrepit engine an 18-month deadline to Obsidian Entertainment to develop a sequel to the beloved Fallout 2 on the Gamebryo engine. The result was an 84 on Metacritic, which was not quite the score they wanted since they were promised a bonus if they got an 85. And to make things worse, the game stopped getting updates in 2011, even though many game-breaking bugs still remain if you don't use mods. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. Fallout New Vegas is the closest to what I would consider as my favorite game of all time. You see, video games weren't allowed in my house as a child. Until my brother wore our parents down, they finally gave in, and maybe half a decade later, there we were opening Christmas presents, and boom, we got a Wii. I got LEGO Star Wars The Complete Saga for Christmas. It was effectively the first game I ever owned, and I dumped probably a thousand or so hours into if I had to guess, and I never finished the blue mini kit mode or got every stud from Newtown, and like I said in my Tribute to Unturned video, I got into LEGOs and LEGO video games, and the first series of games I owned were LEGO games. Once I got tired of Star Wars, I moved on to Indiana Jones, Batman, etc, etc. I've always felt out of place. I have moments here and there, sure, but ultimately I've never really felt a part of something. Video games are my go-to when I was younger to escape a reality that felt increasingly scary to participate in as I aged, and I only really had a handful of friends mostly through forced connections. I met my best friend up until I was 14 through church, and we would play every game together. All of our time was spent playing Minecraft, Roblox, Unturned, generally whatever else we could find for free to play without too many hiccups. And then we started growing apart. We already were in different school districts an hour or so away from each other and we began to grow up. We both would spend less time online, and when we would, the games that we would play would differ dramatically. Now in some previous videos I've talked about the game that I'm most nostalgic for being Unturned, and this friend I mentioned before played Unturned with me before we really grew apart. And after my Unturned server died, I ended up switching to a few other games like Payday 2, Enter the Gungeon, etc. And these are great games, but there's only so long you can do a run of Enter the Gungeon before seeing all there is to see, you know? There's only so many times I can play a public Shadow Raid lobby in Payday 2 and laugh before actually getting upset that the alarm goes off over and over again. And Fallout New Vegas is a game where you can discover new things a decade later and be in awe at this technical marvel. But I've always had Fallout New Vegas in my Steam library since the fall of 2017 when an old friend who I unfortunately lost contact with got it for me because it was on sale and I ended up playing it a little bit but it really just did not connect with me at the time. And there it sat for three and a half more years. Until I was a senior in high school when our classes were online because COVID had struck, I would wake up, eat food, come back to my room and watch YouTube videos for about two hours before the day started. In one of those mornings, I found the Russian Badger video about Fallout New Vegas. <laughs> However, it also means that I have the perception of a deaf bat, the charisma of a misanthrope, and intelligence so low that calling me dumber than a fucking brick is perfectly accurate. That was probably pretty dumb, huh? So me seeing this video going, oh yeah, I have that game too. Sure, let's see what he does. And it captured and piqued my interest from there on. I became obsessed. It's the longest running game, holding a title for my favorite that I think I've had right up there with Minecraft and Unturned and Payday 2 for the hours that I've spent recorded in a game. And I can't imagine myself enjoying many other RPGs that aren't this. You know, we've all got that one game that we can't help but come back to year after year, minuscule change in our life after monumental change in our life. At the end of the day, we just keep coming back and no other game was able to capture me like this. Maybe when I first played the Ace Attorney series, but little else can keep me interested for this many playthroughs and this many runs time and time again. Fallout New Vegas is the story of a package courier left for dead after being ambushed in a small town outside of Vegas carrying a platinum poker chip. More on that later. You get shot. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. Then wake up in a house in Good Springs, figure yourself out, and get going. 
You then hear about a conflict between the town and the group called the Powder Gangers. You take a side and kill the other and then subsequently leave for a town called Prim since the way you would take to Vegas is cut off by animals named Death Claws, who will destroy you. You rescue the deputy from Prim, get a new sheriff somehow, maybe help the NCR take back the prison in the process. Then you see the town of Nipton hit by a group called Caesar's Legion that look like lame furry cosplayers and college sports equipment role-playing the Roman Empire. Wait. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? Three times a day. Just as my namesake campaigned in Gaul before he crossed the Rubicon, so have I campaigned and will cross the Colorado. The NCR, or New California Republic, and Caesar's Legion are the main factions in the game with the two of them having most control over the most areas. The NCR has presence everywhere but is so practically stretched thin, and the Legion keeps pressing its luck and pushing more and more west, taking over towns, spilling radiation all over, crucifying people, selling others into slavery, right in front of the NCR while they're helpless to do anything because once again, they're stretched too thin and don't have enough resources. They literally lose regardless unless you go out of your way to help them with everything. The NCR stands for basically a new version of the United States while Legion is an attempt at recreating ancient Rome. Essentially pick your poison. I'm gonna speed up the story here though. You then go to Boulder City, deal with the great cons there holding NCR hostages whether through diplomacy or violence. Then you get into Freeside, and then onto the Vegas Strip, where you meet with Mr. House or kill Benny right away. But either way, once you leave the Lucky 38, an NCR person will tell you to meet with Ambassador Crocker. And then once you leave the Tops Casino, if he's still alive, Volpes and Colta will tell you to come to Cottonwood Out. Cove and then take Are a trip to, to Legion's Fort. You'll be meeting face to face with the mighty Kaisar himself, founder of the Legion, conqueror of 86 tribes where if you let Benny run away earlier, he'll be right there. Unfortunately for you, Caesar won't let you kill him though. Talk to Benny on your way out. He knows I'm going to let you decide how he dies. Maybe you want to remind him. Try not to smile so wide, baby. You might break your mouth. Not until you I use the, the platinum chip to destroy Mr. House's super secret Securitron army that he kept underground for a few hundred years. The game was rigged from the start, bitch. Kill. Once you get to Vegas, the freedom in the game kind of opens up a little more, but at the same time you also have to decide what faction should rule over Vegas after the second battle of the dam. Oh yeah, all the factions are fighting over the dam because it provides access and security to Vegas and the surrounding region, and whoever controls it has immense geopolitical power and pull in the area. And speaking of pull, or pulling in, like how my segue is pulling you in to tell you to like and subscribe. Come on, you've already watched this much of the video, you're basically done with the video. It might as well be over. You should subscribe, and you should, you know, you really, you really should just... The main ending factions are the NCR, which, kind of, like I already said, is just a attempt at the US, but again. And the Legion, which is the Roman Empire, but today, and like I said earlier, Furry role players wearing repurposed college sports equipment, selling people into slavery, and uh, treating women like uh, objects. Basically, your average uh, online Call of Duty player in like 2008. Oh, yeah, and they own all or most of the Four Corners states. So, compared to the NCR, which is just California, they're pretty powerful. And literally, if you, the courier, do not interrupt their march, they would have captured the dam either way. There's also Mr. House, which is the ending you would have had had you not been shot in the head, uh, which involves kicking out both NCR and Legion to Vegas, and being a sidekick to Mr. House who would then control it. And the Platinum Chip is so powerful and was stolen by Benny because with it, one can upgrade Securitrons across the board and grant Mr. House or whoever's in charge immense power of all Securitrons over a larger area. Behold, for the first time, Securitrons running the Mark II OS. The M235 missile launcher gives the Securitron the ability to engage ground and air targets at significantly longer ranges. And a rapid fire G28 grenade launcher ensures the Securitron is deadly in close range engagements. And the reason Benny stole it is because he hacked his own Securitron to help take Mr. House out of the picture and rule over an independent Vegas. 
and if you don't want to be a slave to a capitalistic tyrant or dictator like Mr. House, you can always go independent. Unless you're in the real United States. In practice, whichever you support has you make peace and get rid of certain factions that you're told to, but I like playing by my own rules and deciding who lives and who dies, so I usually end up going with the independent Vegas route through Yes Man every time. Some of my favorite ways to solve these quests include fighting the boomers, being diplomatic with the cons, and systematically erasing the legion. There, there is a point in every playthrough of mine where I eradicate the Legion. I kill them all. I go to Cottonwood Cove, I either dump the barrels down or I just get rid of them. And then I travel to the fort with three plus companions, including Boone. Some fire fried chicken. Eat them fried chicken, not them all. Eat them fried chicken when I fall. Boom, boom. Eat them fried chicken, not them all. Fried chicken when I lick the pussy, eating fried chicken when I lick all the groceries. I go ask eating fried chicken at the mall. Fried chicken, gotta eat my 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 fried chicken. Boom boom. Fried chicken when I read on my Bible. Pew pew. Fried chicken when I look at my Bible. Fried chicken when I'm looking on Google. Yeah. Fried chicken when I'm going to go scuba dive. Fried chicken when I serve fried chicken when I ball. Fried chicken when I go to outer space and the mall. Fried chicken is my life. Fried chicken is my wife. Fried chicken is my dad. Fried chicken is my Gladys Knight. Fried chicken. Woo. Hey, let me pass me the fried chicken, fam. Hold on. Well, what do you think, Boone? My wife's dead. Oh, you. And uh, I just I just love the rush of being followed by legionary assassins and then getting to use the fat man on them. The game is filled with plenty of fun and engaging quests that take you all around the wasteland. For example, if you do the King's quest line in Freeside, there's a quest where he asks you to take his dog to a special doctor who works at Jacobstown, which is a ski lodge housing super mutants and nightkin nestled high in the mountains. That has its own quests about helping the Nightkin get over their fears of being looked at and their manic schizophrenia as a result of using too many stealth boys. To get there I had to battle Cazadors and Legionaries since at this point I had long been, I had long since been vilified by the Legion since I, you know, killed all their leaders and stuff. Some other fun quests I can think of off memory include, there's a quest where the sniper of a local town wants you to investigate why ghouls are coming from the old Repcon test facility, only to find there's a religious group there that wants to get out and fly away. If you help out the boomers at Nellis Air Force Base, there's one quest you have to do where you have to raise an old B-29 bomber from Lake Mead. Once you do that, the boomers will agree to help you at the dam, regardless of which side you take. Of course and seeing legionaries get blown up by the bomber is never a disappointing sight. Fun quests like this are common throughout the game and there are usually more than one way to complete a quest, and that is such an incredibly tedious method of game design and it needs to be well thought out, which to me makes the game even more impressive considering it was made in only 18 months. People still play New Vegas to this day because it feels like the game reacts to everything you as the player do. If you kill Caesar, people across the wasteland will talk about how they can't believe Caesar's dead, or he got what was coming to him. I'm glad you decided to off one of the most powerful men in the Mojave. Life was getting boring anyway. Really? Someone took out the Legion's boss. Doubt it'll stop them for long, though. If we weren't in Khan territory, I would kill you where you stand. Caesar will be avenged. Here's one on the house for taking down Caesar. Serves him right for treating women like livestock. Names die twice to history. If the West thanks you, the East won't, in time, fall apart. Back to the tribes, maybe. I want to focus a little on the world building and set design here, though. Fallout is serious in that its original intention is set to focus on life post-nuclear war after the bombs fell in a desolate wasteland as societies attempt to rebuild not where people still have to scavenge food from a pile of rubble 200 years after a nuclear war. And I think the set design of this game is one of its strongest suits. There's a reason you can see the Lucky 38 from almost anywhere on the map. It's meant to be the focal point of the game and the city itself. Every other area has thought put into it as how it's arranged as well. Fiends can't repair parts of the city because they don't have the resources to and would prefer living in Vault 3 to the outside world because there's the NCR and traders 
and wandering wastelanders such as yourself who would probably try and kill them. I think some of the best designed areas in the game though has got to be on the strip. It kind of goes without saying, but the strip is the focus of the game besides the dam. The NCR outpost in the strip is in the furthest back part of the strip, making you really consider if you want to support the NCR or not. But enough of how the wasteland looks, I haven't even shown you how my character looks, or I guess, plays. When you begin the game, you go through Doc Mitchell's test to make you better or worse at certain stats, using the Vigor Tester to allocate special points, selecting traits, etc, etc. The always correct option is Wild Wasteland. If for no other reason than the sick fucking alien blaster you can get in the hills north of Vegas. There's some like Built to Destroy which ups crit chance at weapons decaying faster and some like Four Eyes which require your character to wear glasses to get a perception buff. But those are, don't really matter all that much. So once you build your character you go through the game and at some point you usually end up meeting the leaders of each faction. But you can skip meeting the NCR or at least Ambassador Crocker since there's no requirements there, you'll probably have to go to the fort at some point, especially if you're doing a Legion House or Yes Man playthrough. And Caesar wants you to destroy the Securitron army, but he doesn't actually check if you do, he's just like, alright word homie, you can deal with Benny now. I felt the ground shake a while. There are rewards for doing as I command. You can actually, at the beginning, upset and annoy Caesar if you just respond with, I should be going to everything he says. You should be listening. That's what you should be doing. That's right, you should be going. Because you have work to do. I'm not asking you to do this, I'm telling you. Now take the platinum chip, go down to that bunker or whatever it is, and destroy whatever gizmo happy Brahmin shit you find. Now get to it. Wale. Wale? Like the rapper? At the end of the game, you go fight the second battle of Hoover Dam. If you're backing House, Yes Man, or NCR, you fight against the Legion, but if you're Legion, you fight against NCR. You move across the dam, killing Legionaries, uh, and you end up fighting Legate Lanius, who is one of the strongest NPCs in the entire game, and it really shows. Before the fight, the entire game builds the dam up to be this crazy moment, and building Lanius up to be this insanely strong commander. And I would say it does, the hype doesn't really pay off, but it feels damn good to march across Hoover Dam. No pun intended. At the end of the non-Legion aligned battle, you march into the Legate's camp, deal with some Legionaries and Praetorians, and then you must deal with Legate Lanius himself, who can actually be dealt with non-violently with some extremely high speech and barter checks, but in my honest opinion, that's no fun, so I take a bunch of Psycho and then usually use the anti-material rifle and... I want to get back to the mechanics of the game though. Fallout 3 took away traits and reputation for a new system involving Karma. And Karma is still present in New Vegas, but Karma doesn't determine how you're treated in the wasteland, only reputation does. For example, there aren't people to come after you if your karma is too high or too low. You only have Legion or NCR hit squads if your reputations with them are low. The NCR hit squads are seen as lame. Since you haven't pissed yourself, I'll assume that you don't know who we are. Next time I'll bring my sickle and wear my black cloak. See, the NCR sends us when they want terrible things done to terrible people. In a cage, wah, I read a... You've got three days to improve your reputation with the NCR or we come for you without all this pleasant conversation. About a, a did you say want want to a 10 year old with Down syndrome what being I taken said from is her you mother? Because they whine about how you have three days to improve your reputation with the Republic, whereas the Legion just shows up and is like, you're gonna die, bitch. The Kaisar has marked you for death and the Legion obeys. Ready yourself for battle. And where you go and who you treat well and who you don't treat well will impact your reputation with certain places. For instance, if you help Good Springs with the first quest, you'll become liked or idolized by Good Springs and shunned or vilified by the Power Gangers. The new mechanics introduced in New Vegas are a way of bridging the gameplay differences between Fallout 3 and the original 2. And this is one of the places where I think the game shines in connecting the older and newer generation of Fallout fans, but to be completely honest, I think where the game absolutely shines overall is in the writing. 
The universe is completely believable, and it builds off already established concepts, storylines, and lore of Fallout 1 and 2, but it's accessible because you don't have to have played Fallout 1 and 2 to enjoy this game. Those references are usually more one-offs anyway, and everything in this game just makes sense and fits atmosphere perfectly. You wouldn't expect a Roman aesthetic, US military aesthetic, post-apocalypse, futuristic, and 1950s aesthetics to all work perfectly in the same game, but it's almost effortless how everything works so well. And it's not that the writing is good sometimes or most of the time, I would venture as far as to say the writing is good in this game 98% of the time, and it's usually very in-depth and intricate and the game is generally well written. I pray for the safety of all good people who come to Zion, even Gentiles. But we can't expect God to do all the work. The amount of different endings alone based on your choices as a player is incredible, and another reason that shows how this game is something that should not even manage to exist. The Legion is sick because Caesar is written so well that you know he's evil. You know he's a fucked up tyrant, but you almost understand why and want to support his efforts. And same thing with Mr. House, he's almost on the same level as Caesar. But when you hear about why he is the way he is, why he acts the way he acts, it's just another thing It's like, you, you understand and you believe it. I mean, listen to him talk about democracies. His, he has a funny line where he says, Nothing to impede progress. If you want to see the fate of democracies, look out the windows. Showing you that the NCR is directionless. It's important to go over the fact that Fallout New Vegas' biggest theme is letting go of the past. It's a symbol that's present everywhere. In the main factions, the characters, it's visible in all the DLCs and all the companions. It's an important theme we can apply in real life as well. The fact that Caesar brings up Hegelian dialectics will always be funny to me. He says that he built his legion off ancient Rome as an example because the citizens of Rome dedicated themselves to the cause of something greater than Rome itself. And in terms of societies to build off of, the Roman Empire did last quite a while. Even though it split into two and then had a bunch of other offshoots that didn't really matter, and some things become less useful in nuclear fallout, and it's never certain they can depend on weapons or energy weapons. So going back to traditional ways of fighting, seems like it wouldn't be super effective, but in a world of nuclear fallout, who knows? I mean, if you pick Veronica as a companion, she'll even pull you to the side and say, Ordinary guys with knives and bullets, and they're taking over Nevada. The companions in this game are extremely well written too, arguably one of the highlights of the game. They each have believable motivations and reasons why they act a certain way, and all of their main quests involve giving up some old past of theirs that they no longer identify with, or struggle to create a new identity out of. Arcade Ganon's trying to move on from the fact he was involved with the Enclave, Boone wants to recover from Bitter Springs, Veronica wants the Brotherhood of Steel to change, but knows it's a rotten organization to the core in the sense that they don't stand a chance staying the same as they are. Raul goes back to his past while creating a new identity for himself as a ghoul cowboy. These characters are super complex and have different choices you can make during their quest to alter their endings as it relates to their future after the dam. I've never taken Cass as a companion because every time I try to talk to her, she gets all whiny crybaby that I have bad karma. You are such an asshole sometimes. Look, maybe you were like this before I signed up with you, but if you keep acting this way, I'm not gonna stick around much longer. Your life is nothing. You serve zero purpose. You should kill yourself now. I always like taking her to the Van Graffs for them to deal with her. Seriously, she's probably the worst companion in the game. Naturally, you can't make a video on Fallout New Vegas without talking about its interesting cast of DLC expansions, of which there are four. Dead Money, Honest Hearts, Old World Blues, and Lonesome Road. Dead Money is great, in the sense that it's written extremely well. In terms of how it plays, I fucking hate Dead Money. Dead Money involves the player character being captured by the former Brotherhood of Steel Elder Father Elijah and having to infiltrate the Sierra Madre Casino. He's in charge of the plan because he strapped you all with bomb collars as you work with Dog slash God, Dean Domino and Christine Royce, who, side note, was on a mission to assassinate Elijah after he separated her from Veronica and a bunch of other things. Christine got caught by Elijah during in the old world blues area who rewired her vocal cords to sound like the singer who created this sound like the singer who the creator of the sierra madre kept locked inside to activate the vault via voice control and a bunch of other stuff i don't know man i think dead money is well written but playing it is awful and i never play dead money when i play new vegas but honest hearts on the other hand is a fun little campaign about the burned man former malpai's legate joshua graham 
Caesar's former legate who was covered in pitch, lit on fire, and tossed into the Grand Canyon after the Battle of Hoover Dam, the first one, only to survive and then crawl back to his homeland. And the DLC in particular focuses on the conflict between tribals, most notably the Dead Horses and Sorrows with a group called the White Legs. The White Legs want to join the Legion, and they're taught to fight and use guns by a courier, one mentioned before, though not by name, who goes by Ulysses, former member of the Legion. And he actually ended up intercepting Christine and Elijah, as well as parts of the next DLC. But Honest Hearts usually ends with you and Joshua Graham killing your way through the White Legs, dealing with the whiny crybaby Daniel. And in my playthroughs, I feel like I'm President Truman and Daniel's Oppenheimer talking about some I am become death destroyer of worlds, and I'm just like, whatever nerd, let's kill some White Leg fucks. The next DLC, Old World Blues, is probably my favorite. You're sent to Big MT, Big Mountain, Big Empty, whatever you want to call it, an area owned by a group of researchers called the Think Tank who want to experiment on the Mojave Wasteland, but one of their researchers brainwashed them and made the rest of them forget about their past, until Ulysses shows up, philosophically probing them about the old world, to which they remember they existed, and since you show up as the only successful lobotomy ever performed in the Big Empty, they want to experiment on your brain and take everything it learned to then use that knowledge to transplant their brains into lobotomites and become human again, and then use their scientific knowledge to experiment on the Mojave Wasteland. The one who forced him to forget, Dr. Mobius, took your brain after your lobotomy so the others couldn't get a hold of it. The Think Tank characters, in my opinion, are all great. Their sarcastic little quips are amazing, and the DLC is ripe with classic Fallout humor. Just look at it. The way it blinks. It's like a big, hairless teddy bear. How do you top a near-perfect DLC, though? To some people, you can't, and I understand that. To me, Lonesome Road might just be a long endgame combat gauntlet, but what makes it great is the experience you have in the other DLCs before this point that elevates it to a higher point than the others. Ulysses is a character that you hear about having an effect in the story in much the same way you do. It makes you feel like the world is dynamic and there's another character out there, someone else out there who's equal to you and that you aren't some invincible force, unlike what some other Fallout games will make you think. A lot of people don't like Ulysses due to his forced ramblings about the bear and the bull. We're gonna be talking about the divides. Do you find it amusing that we'll be talking about the Mojave? <laughs> and we will definitely be spending a lot of time talking about the bear, then the bull. But me personally, I actually really like it. People also don't like the fact that he holds a grudge and personal vendetta against the player because of events that occur outside the game, but to me I'm not upset by that because that's just backstory, and it's more lore, dude, I'm fine with it. But the moment when you stare down Ulysses at Ulysses Temple is one of my favorite moments from the entire game. So you came, courier, to what? Watch your homeland burn one last time? Kill me, perhaps? Judging by your shadow, maybe you can't let your machine go. Doesn't matter now. Either way, the Divide Giants are awakening. The missiles here on their way home. There is no way to stop them. Ulysses is similar to Lanius in much the same way you can talk him down and not fight with an extremely high speech skill check. But if you fail the check, you have to fight him, and to be honest, with all the iBots and Mark men flooding into the temple, it's arguably a harder fight than against even Lanius. So I make sure to up my speech before I talk to him so I can team up with him against the Mark men. If we cannot prevent what comes, then let us make our stand here. Two couriers, together at the Divide. And after you do that, you can direct where missiles go, and by doing that, unlock three late game areas. The Courier's Mile, Long 15, and Dry Wells. If you nuke NCR, you unlock Long 15. If you nuke the Legion, you unlock Dry Wells. But if you nuke both Legion and NCR, you will unlock Long 15, Dry Wells, and the Courier's Mile. Dry Wells is where Ulysses says his tribe was put to the blade and assimilated into the Legion, where he says Volpez did not accept them as equals. And Something, one of the best parts about the Legion in the game is how every Legionary has a story about how the Legion took their tribe in and assimilated them. And it's always traumatic. It means a nationalist, imperialist, totalitarian, homogenous culture that obliterates the identity of every group it conquers. Long-term stability at all costs. And it's always horrifying. And something else that makes this game perfect. You can tell how other characters feel about the Legion based on how they pronounce 
his name. God tier game design, bro. And when looking at all the DLCs, seeing how everything's intertwined, it just makes me want to go, mwah, you know? Someone with passion was here. Someone, someone cooked, cooked here for real. Overall, I don't know if there will be a game that exists that will be nearly the same level of quality as Fallout New Vegas. It wasn't The Outer Worlds. It's not Starfield. And I don't know what to say or suggest. I want game devs to try harder to put out better quality games, but considering what, that Bethesda just wants to repackage Fallout 4 and Skyrim over and over again, I think we might have to give up on trusting them to do anything on this level. There were even talks of a remake with Obsidian, but I'm pretty sure that was scrapped. Fallout New Vegas really spoke to me because I was in a dull period of life, bored by schoolwork every day and awaiting fresh stimuli while the senioritis hit and characters' motivations and identity struggles really spoke to me. Veronica wanting to free the Brotherhood from their confines after dealing with being in a lockdown. That hit me deep. Her struggle of wanting to be accepted by the Brotherhood while wanting them to change but knowing they won't. Even from a first playthrough that hit, and seeing characters like Veronica and Ulysses affected me in a time when I was going through my own uncertainties identity-wise. I had just finished high school when I played through the game for the first time after the pandemic, and I was effectively forced to move on from my friends, and to make it worse later that year I had to move across the country and go to college at a separate university than all of my friends. I had to forge my own path for the future and become more in touch with myself and my emotions, and that's still something I struggle with. Playing this game helped me formulate and figure out how that's possible. If you haven't played Fallout New Vegas, I highly recommend it. Yes, vanilla, it kinda sucks, but only on the technical side. Yeah, there are a lot of crashes, there's a weird stutter, some of the things are bugged, but it's still fun. And Modding it is difficult, but it's not the hardest thing ever. It's definitely doable, even if you don't know how like level of detail and shit like that works. It's I would recommend it. It's such a good game, and the experience you'll have, it's so, it's, it's worth it. If you're considering playing it and you don't know, I think you should. I think you should. It's gonna start off slow, you're gonna be like, wow, this game sucks. I hate playing this. And before you know it, you'll be... You know, you, you would have already dumped like 30 hours, and you're like, wow, I actually don't hate this game. It's kind of fun. And that's the tipping point. That's when you know that it was a good game. But I digress. I know that Joshua Sawyer and the rest of the Obsidian team is probably tired about hearing how much people love this game, and how it's a cult classic, and because of all the idiots online who like it, but there's a reason people love this game. There's a reason that almost 15 years later, people replay Fallout New Vegas. So to Joshua Sawyer, Chris Avalone, the rest of Obsidian for making this possible, thank you for making this game. And thank you to my friends who kept acting like I would never make this video after I promised it for, at this point, years, you know. And uh, thank you, the viewer. Uh, thank you for watching. Like and subscribe.